Are you going to tell us about an I receive? <laughs> yeah, I should do it. I should do it. Do it all walking through the source code to open MPI and how, how MPI receives implemented. <laughs> the, the title was already getting quite long, so I thought beyond MPI send, MPI receive, MPI init, and MPI finalize would be would be pushing it a bit. <laughs> So yeah, for, um, since maybe six months ago, I and then Lattelie McKellar have been working on porting some uh, Lattice field theory code to make use of MPI. And so doing that has taught me more about MPI than I knew before, because I basically knew what you found out in the introductory MPI tutorials, which is how to send and receive point to point. So I want to wanted to talk a little bit about what I've learned in the last six months-ish. So background, we're working on some lattice field theory code. It was originally written in a mix of Fortran 4 and Fortran 77. Um, and we found that using the Intel dash parallel option scaled quite well up to four threads, and then not so well after that point. Um, I spent a couple of months refactoring this to Fortran 90-ish. I say ish because I don't remember if I used any 95 or not. Um, indirection I replaced with explicit ind indexing. This was a deliberate choice firstly because I thought, you know, in indirection is a memory access that makes things slightly slower. Also because I wanted to understand what the code was doing and having all indirection everywhere was making that quite hard. So I moved to having three explicit indices uh, for x, y, and t. Uh, all arrays are declared with static sizes, which makes life easy in some ways and harder in some ways. Um, it's a three-dimensional problem, and then uh, you have one to three additional degrees of freedom. So you have between four and six-dimensional arrays going on. Uh, so for those who aren't familiar with lattice field theory, I have not very much to say about, about the lattice, really. The, important things to know about lattice in general is that you have some n-dimensional array of points, the points are sites, and in sometimes you need to know that the point, the bits between them are links and the squares are plaquettes. In this talk you don't actually need to know that, but it's the diagram I have to hand. Um, the distance between each of the points in every direction, for this problem at least, is the same. So it's isotropic, it's a hypercubic lattice, the volume, the lengths of the dimensions of the lattice in each direction don't have to be the same, although currently they are. Um, they're, set, they're set to be the same rather than being encoded to be the same. It's just the parameters have to have the same value. Uh, so to partition this for uh, MPI, it's quite simple. I think um, finite, uh, finite element type people would call this a structured grid. Um, so you, you have some volume, you partition it, and different processes get different, different blocks of it. All the blocks have to be the same size. I mean, there's no, there's no scientific reason they have to be the same size, but each point does the same amount of work. So if they're not the same size, then you're going to have processes waiting. So in every implementation I've ever seen, it enforces that you have the same size. So that means your parallelization has to be a factor of your, your dimensionality in each direction. So you can see in this case, I've divided it into four blocks, a red, a green, a blue, and a black, with apologies to colorblind. Is there anyone colorblind in the room? No, okay. Apologize, apologies to YouTube people who are, might be colorblind in looking at this. I might put some captions on the YouTube video so I can just watch how eager I'm feeling. But yeah, you say you've got you've got four blocks and communicate um, computation happens on each block on a separate process and we're happy. So moving on, a quick reminder of what MPI is in case anyone has forgotten or hasn't encountered it before. When I wrote the talk I didn't know he was going to be in the room. Um, it's the message passing interface, so it's an interface that passes messages in order to uh, do things in parallel. It was born in 1991, it's currently at version 3.1, and it follows what's called a single program multiple data model. So you write one program, 
you compile it and it runs however many times you like and the only thing that differs is the data. And so the program will follow different branches depending on what that data, data is. Ultimately, it's the same, it's the same source code. Um, that's what that means. And then, then communication is explicit. You tell the program when you want to pass a message, what you want the message to be. It's the, a very different paradigm to something like OpenMP, where you say, I would like this to be in parallel, please. And then it works out how to do that. So with MPI, it's very much you work out your parallelization scheme and encode that by telling messages where to go. You can initialize a program with MPI in it and finish it with MPI finalize. The first one has to be there. The second one, obviously, the program's finished by that point, so it won't break it if you don't. Um, you can do point to point send and receive with MPI send and MPI receive. So the typical um, tutorial example is you have one process that has an if. Um, if I'm on rank zero, then send. If I'm on rank one, then receive. And then some data gets passed from one to one. Uh, you can extend this because those are blocking, so they don't return until uh, the buffer is safe to use. This is the difference between synchronous and uh, non-synchronous, by the way. Synchronous doesn't return until the message is received. Whereas these blocking calls just don't return until the buffer is empty, or is it safe to use them. Uh, there's also immediate versions of these. We had a discussion a while back about what the I in I send means. It means immediate, apparently, because it returns immediately. As soon as, as, soon as you call into it, it returns again. So these are non-blocking, uh, you, you so which means you have to be careful not to, be, not to edit the buffer, because the buffer might still be in use. Uh, you can also do point to all operations with MPI Bcast, which is short for broadcast, broadcast. And then you have collectives like MPI Reduce, MPI All Reduce, that work across a bunch of um, a bunch of processes and then take values from all of them and turn them into a single value. So that is an MPI tutorial in about a minute and a half. So you can all go off and write MPI programs now. Please don't. Please listen to the rest of the talk. Um, so the things I've learned. I'm starting with thing number three, because I've numbered them in order I discovered them, but I'm presenting them in order that it kind of makes sense, because I'm gonna, uh, I, for instance, this one, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to omit IR in all of my future uh, slides, so I didn't want to have that discovered later on. Anyway, so MPI F08. So this is specifically for Fortran programmers. Um, Fortran 2008 defines a lot of nice features. Um, particularly for interoperability with C. Um, MPI is implemented in C, and it's the MPI forum that pushed for these improvements to be made in Fortran. So it makes sense that now they have this Fortran 2008 compatible interface that is a lot easier to use, with some caveats. So the first thing it does is it makes the I error return variable option. So in C, when you call an MPI function, it returns a value that you can assign to something or discard, whereas in Fortran, uh, MPI calls are subroutines, so they can't return anything. So in older versions of MPI, you had to pass an extra variable at the end of every single MPI call to store the return value. And now that's been made optional, so you don't have to anymore, which is nice. Uh, everything isn't an integer anymore. So since Fortran something, maybe 2003, uh, you've had the ability to define custom data types in Fortran. And so now, uh, rather than uh, for instance, uh, you pass two arguments to MPI wait, an MPI request, and an MPI status. Uh, in the previous versions of MPI for Fortran, those would all be integers. Uh, whereas now they have their own types, so you can check that you're passing the right arguments to the right places, that kind of thing. Uh, you can also do in place reductions, which means if you've got if, say, say you've summed something, for instance here, I've summed this uh, velocity squared variable on each process, and I want that, that value to have the value it has globally, because that's exactly how it would work if I were programming for a, uh, in serial. Uh, I can just say, instead of saying the receive, uh, which one is it? The send buffer, you replace the send buffer with MPI in place, and it just looks yeah, like the receive, the receive buffer. It's the receive buffer. Yeah, receive, yeah. I always get this argument back to front. Thank you. 
Yeah. No, but this is actually how we work. I'm here in places looking to receive mm. as a DNS yeah, I, I copied the code out of working code, so I know it works. I just <laughs> forgot the semantics of it. It's, it. It always seems backwards to me. We should wish I could go around to explain it. Ah, well, probably because it's the first thing you encounter, isn't it? The sand buffer. You, you go to sand before you receive. Anyway. I guess also when you just talk about these these things, you would say, I don't know, it, it sort of feels natural to say sun received, but it doesn't feel natural to say receive sun. Hmm. Because you have to send something before you can receive it. Yeah, but in that case, MPI in place could be going the second argument rather than the first, if you wanted it in the receive buffer. For me, it, may, it would make sense for it to be in the receive buffer because you know, you're receiving things and you want it to be received in place. Hmm. Whereas, in fact, you want to send it, and then it's, I guess it's telling API, look in the receive buffer to find the variable you want to send. Yeah. But the, the, the send buffer is the thing you create before you before the call. So the send buffer is there regardless. Mm. You created the send buffer before MPI gets involved. So I think mm. that's why it goes with the send buffer. It's because it's, it's a contiguous lump of memory that's waiting. Oh, right, because I, I never think about using or reduce from more than one variable at a time, but I guess if you do, do want to use a bunch of memory, it makes sense. Yeah. Ten points mark. So next thing I learned was how to use subarray types. So this is just a an entire subroutine out of the code that that we wrote. This is defining some chunk of our array that we want to send or receive, or no, not both. Either, we either want to send or receive it. So we. We're going to use this call to MPI type create subarray um, to define it, and then we're going to use MPI type commit to commit it, because those have to be two separate operations for reasons that I don't quite understand. Um, but yeah, we have two operations that ultimately create a, a bit of memory that has this type in that we can then reuse whenever we have an array of a particular size that we want to either send or receive. And you can see you need to tell it exactly what the size of the array that you're working with is, then what bits of it you want to use, and then where you, yeah, where you, what size, what subsize, and what start. So what shape it is and where, where from. This is slightly different to the MPI vector. If you've encountered the MPI vector, the MPI vector is a stencil that you can then blob anywhere onto an array, whereas this takes an entire array and has a predetermined position within it. Can you ask a question? You can. Um, this is just a foreground question. What are the slashes together with your parentheses? Uh, making an inline array definition. Ah, okay. I, see. I, there's, I think there are other ways of writing it as well, but I'm not 100% clear on the difference between them. You can sort of do things that are a little bit like this convention. A little bit. Right. The, the, the honest answer is I saw it written that way in an MPI tutorial and copied it. So the thing I learned number one, sorry, that was number three, two, and then number one, is MPI IO. So everyone says MPI IO is complicated and it's more difficult to implement than standard IO, and you do it if you're doing a really big, um, a really big calculation, and actually, it's not that hard. It's, it's some work over um, using standard Fortran I.O. if you're not in parallel. But once you're in parallel, you're going to have to partition up your problem anyway. So using MPI I.O. avoids having to define this massive buffer that you bring the entire file into and then having to work out which bits go to which nodes, that kind of thing. MPI I.O. does that a lot for you, which is kind of nice. Um, it gives high performance because you're not having to channel everything through a single process, read it, and then send it back out over the network. Um, it works really well with subarray types. So I had to know subarrays in order to make this work, but I started writing the MPIO before I started writing the subarrays. So. Uh, come on, computer. There we go. So these are the four lines that you need once you have an MPI subarray type defined uh, in order to use MPIO. So 
you open a file, which seems relatively obvious. It's the same way that you would open a file in Fortran, except the syntax looks different. Um, you're passing in that you want, I'm passing in this case, I want to, I want to do read only. MPI info null is just, please don't, please don't do anything to do with MPI, MPI info because I don't understand it, I don't care about it. Um, then you create an MPI file handle object, which is just like a regular file handle object but with MPI. Um, then you set a view on it. This is where our MPI's, uh, MPI IO type comes in, it's on the right. So this is, this is using MPIO type is the subarray type that defines the bit of the lattice that I want to look at on this process. So I've just said, I want this block. Um, this is the block for this process. Please go and zoom to this section of the file. Quick, quick, quick question. Yeah. The um, MPIO IO type, I can't remember the previous code. Is that, that sort of like an instance? Does that contain, that contains not only the shape, but also the position, right? Yes. Yeah, it's exactly one of these subrow types. So I've right. defined, I've defined what the global lattice volume is, what the local lattice volume is, and what position in the global lattice the local lattice is. So I, I open the file. I tell MPI which bit of the file I want. I then tell MPI to go and read it, which I, I say tell it I want to read a certain number of. Um, so a certain number of real numbers. Uh, I don't use the subarray type here because I'm reading into an array that isn't the global lattice size. So I, I have to be explicit on the size that I want there. Um, and then I close the file again. And that's only one more step than it would be to write the file in C, um, or sorry, to read the file in C, open file, view, Read file and close, and only a couple more than it would be in Fortran. So, actually, no, you still have open and close in Fortran, so it's the same. It's, it's equally well one more step than it would be in, to, to read it in Fortran. So, it's just slightly more syntax. So, yeah, MPI, MPIO, use it. It is performant and not that difficult. That's a question. Do I have an answer? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Because I don't remember what is uh, 0 underscore 8 there. Uh, that is the number 0 um, mm -hmm. when 8 bits, I know, 8 bytes, so that's a double precision 0, I think. Or no, it's an integer, it's a long integer 0, I think. Okay, because underscore 8 is just to say 8 bytes. Yeah, yeah, okay. so underscore something in modern Fortran is spe specifying length of the constant. Uh, G Fortran gives you a bunch of warnings if you don't include that, because it does really strict a bunch of checking. Oh, I just have a question, mm -hmm. which I don't know, maybe it's obscure or something. But I guess it's so. The thing is, I've been thinking about adding MPIO IO to something that's coming. Hi, sorry. Um, don't be using it because the IO there is written, you know, in the old-fashioned way where we just stream everything to a master process mm. that writes the code. Yeah. Um, and this sort of makes more sense, it's just slightly more complicated. And I guess it's flexible enough that it's easy to set up like global offsets and things like that. And like basically so all the OpenQCD files have like a bit of information at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, before the lattice actually starts. Yeah. And it's easy to set up like skip three doubles in your Set that on things like that. Um, is that defined in here? I don't forget. I don't remember. It. Um, yes, that's that's what this zero is. That's the offset for the start of the file that you're looking at. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, you know the number of bytes, you tell it. So the next thing that I did, or that I, I learned that I didn't know before, I mean, I'd heard of Cartesian communicators before, but I'd never written one. So, um, yeah, Cartesian communicator is you have some set of axes, and your um, your processes live on that grid, which is exactly what we had in the illustration earlier. So, um, yeah, so you you have some processes that are now labelled by x, y, z indices. You can have as many indices as you like, I think. Or at least as many as you, you, you can have as many as we needed. Um, 
So, and you can also create with periodic boundary conditions. So this is the call that we use to set that up. Um, so MPI can't create is create a Cartesian communicator. We say it wants to be a subset of MPI com world, the global communicator. Um, in this case, we've said that we want three dimensions, and then MP, X, Y, and T are just the number of processes of each dimension. So you end up with MPX times MPY times MPT processes, which I, uh, elsewhere in the program we have a constraint that makes sure that happens before it reaches the point. So this way it's error. Then I've said I want periodic boundary conditions in all three of those directions, because we do. And then true, that that true there is allow reordering. So you can tell the MPI implementation, you can move the processes around if it will make it faster. Um, MPICH explicitly says in its man page that it completely discards this information, um, but possibly other MPI implementations you'll get better performance if you have this true rather than false. Basically, if you're only ever interacting through the uh, Cartesian communicator, then you can set, set that to true happily. If you're also do messing around with local in, with um, global indices from API Com world, then you might need to set that to false. And then com is just the name of the communicator that we're creating. Okay. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, if you in that case, if you if you're also messing around with com world, mm. it still it still doesn't help because I have no idea, right? I don't know what indices I'm going to get over this quick Car Cartesian um, communicator um, until um, until it's too late in a sense. You know, if I wanted to optimize for the indices of of um, mm. Com world, and I want to know. I, I want to make some optimal decisions on which processes take on which identities from mm. there. I'm sort of scuppered by the fact that I don't know that it's. I, I can't control this, right? I can't. I can't do it the other way around. I think the ordering is predictable if you don't allow it to reorder. All right. So if you say false, you you, you, you kind you, of guess it'll be sequential or something like that. Yeah. Right. I see. Yeah. It, it's. It's probably C like ordering, and so the, yeah, the fastest yeah. moving okay. index is whichever one it is. Yeah. So then, if, I want, if I'm on my, uh, my current process and I would like to get my nearest neighbors or some, some offset, uh, I can call MPI count shift, which says, okay, this one's saying I would like on this Cartesian communicator in dimension number two. I would like to shift one, and I'd like to put the results into IPT up and IPT down. Because it does give you the index in both directions, because normally if you want one, you want the other, because you'll be doing things symmetrically across your volume. While I was writing this code, I, I, I got a new appreciation for the fact that when written in typewriter font, up is down, upside down. You take this DM and rotate it 180 degrees and get up. As soon as you can spot that, suddenly you, you start misreading it because your brain starts to rotate things when it reads it. <laughs> you know, like you, you can read a piece of paper upside down quite easily. And your brain starts doing that naturally. It's kind of annoying. Uh, the, the most recent thing I learned in the last seven days is this idea of persistent MPR communications. So when you do an MPI send MPI receive pair, there is some overhead. There's some handshaking going on, working out which node you want to send to, how to get there across the network, what kind of data to data you're going to send, allocating buffers, that kind of thing. And that, that takes finite amount of time. So if you're in a, a very tight loop, then this is a big waste of time. You're repeating the same stuff over and over. Uh, you want to you want to factorize that section of code outside of the loop, and so instead, what you can do is you can use these commands npi send init and npi receive init uh, to initialize some communication channel. Do that outside the loop, then inside the loop, just use npi start, or if you have more than one of them, you can use npi start all to start a communications. Then. Uh, these are non-blocking, so you, you will also want an MPI wait or an MPI wait all. Um, and then that does the entire thing, in principle, with significantly less overhead. 
and then there's also I think you, you do need to then uh, release some resources afterwards because this creates this creates some request objects that you then need to release afterwards so you don't keep overflowing with too many MPI request objects. Um, we use the same. That's it. You, you if you create start, it, start then you wait, and then after you wait, should be. I don't know. There's any. Is there any reasons? You can you you uh, if you're in a function and you you're it's outside of a loop, you can reuse it for that loop. And you can reuse it for the rest of that function. But once the function returns, if you go back into the function later, then the once it goes out of scope. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but, but, uh, but if, if you initialize at the start of the program, then you can pass it into the function and use it. But you, it is specific to a particular, I think it's specific to a particular object. So it's specific to a particular um, memory address as well, I think, right? I believe so. So the documentation is not useful if you want to send from the same memory address on this process yeah, yeah. the same memory address on that process. Yeah, so if things are moving around memory, then it's not useful. So something I learned about yesterday that I, I misread and thought it was already there uh, is that it's proposed for MPI 3.2 um, that this will also work on reduction operations. So there is quite a significant overhead when you do an or reduce of uh, working out where the rest of the processes are, that kind of thing. And look, looking at MPI profiles from this code suggests that takes a non-negligible amount of time surprisingly, even though we're just reducing one, one floating point number over eight processes, whatever, it's surprisingly long amount of time. So being able to do this for collectives would be really nice, but it's not there yet. It, no, nobody, well, I can't find out any information when MPI 3.2 is coming out. I mean, there are, this has been discussed since 2015 as a proposal for MPI Next and more recently MPI 3.2, but it's not out yet. I mean, once it's out, it will take a couple of years for the um, library vendors to actually implement it, unfortunately. So that is that is the five things that I've learnt over the course of this. So now I'm going to quickly talk through the actual implementation of putting this into practice. So Halo, this is the sign I was looking for earlier. Um, so we, we are doing stencil computations that involve nearest neighbor interactions. So we need to have the adjacent uh, point on our lattice, and sometimes that is on the adjacent process. So what we do is we add a one side border around all, all three dimensions of our lattice, and then s store a copy of the, the data that should be there. So then we can access it as the nearest neighbor. We only do this if the neighbor is needed. And then, yeah, we, like I said, we store the contents of from the adjacent lattice, from, from, from the adjacent process in the appropriate buffer. Um, we added some functions to update the halos. Uh, we created a module called comms to do this. And then the idea was we could then swap this out for the MPI version once, the MPI, once we actually implemented the MPI. As it turned out, they ended up using slightly different interfaces, so they could have just been different modules, but. So, then we test that each function still gives the same results. This is a common theme that as we're doing massive refactoring and heavy lifting, we do test regularly to make sure that we've not broken it. Step two, doing the I.O. So this, when, when, I, when I started doing the MPI implementation, I thought I'd do something self-contained first rather than trying to jump in to do, rewrite the entire program's uh, calculation scheme. So I decided this, this is self-contained because I can, I can test afterwards that the thing I've read is the thing I read before, and the rest of the program still works. So, re-implement, read and write of, of, gauge, of field configurations. Uh, so the existing implementation saved its random number generator state in the configuration. So, what we do is we store the state from rank zero, and then when we read back in, we reseed the rest of the ranks by taking the state we've read in and adding the rank, adding, adding the rank to it. Then we check that read and write still get the same results. So the only thing to note here is that it was not, I couldn't work out how to do this entirely with MPIO. So it does the configuration part of it with MPIO and then uses Fortran IO on rank zero to reopen the file and add the right bit at the end, which is 
So it took, it took longer than it felt it should, and it's slightly messier than it feels it should be, but it works. So Next, we need to initialize our subarray types. So added this MPI initialization function that gets called at the start of the program if you're using MPI. It calls MPI init, and it sets up subarray types. So there has to be a separate type for each array shape, for each uh, boundary, so the t t um, um, the top, the bottom, each direction, so x, y, t, and each data type. So which means we have 4D in both real and complex, and we have 5D and 6D in complex. Uh, we have the x, y, t directions up, down, and for send and receive, because uh, they, those will be different buffers. And then we have for varying sizes of the fourth, fifth, and sixth dimensions. So we use arrays for this. Um, we populate only the required array elements, so we don't waste a bunch of MPI resources creating MPI subarray types we're never going to use. Uh, so for example, uh, size 6 um, in our six dimensional arrays has three possible values, 1, 12, and 25. Uh, so we create an array that has those dimensions, and, but we only populate elements 1, 12, and 25. And because the um, MPI type is under the hood is stored as an integer, then that means we are, we are only effectively storing 25 integers for, um, plus the size of the three subarray types that we actually want to use. And we also create the type that we need for MPI over here, rather than having it in the MPI functions. So next was the halo communication, which is the kind of the bulk of the writing. So for each dimensionality, we do a function that calls both MPI I send and MPI I receive. Uh, it also takes in an array of MPI requests and fills it because we need to do MPI wait all later on. Then we have a separate function that actually calls MPI wait all. Um, so it only takes in an array of 12 MPI request objects. It doesn't need to know anything about dimensionality, so that can, that can just be a simple, simple function. And this can be unit tested to make sure that it's working, that things are moving correctly between processes. So then parallelize most functions. Yeah, this is where the bulk was, rather than the previous slide, is actually using those functions to parallelize the rest of the code. So we go through we, all arrays, we replace global dimensions with local dimensions. And then before any function call that relies on a halo, we make sure that it's being communicated. So we work out where, where it was last edited, add a halo update start at that point, and then completely update in time to, in time to actually use the data. There should not be a backslash there. That's me failing it later. Um, but yeah, any time there's a collective, we obviously now need MPI or reduce to make sure that the entire process, the entire job communicates. And then any MPI calls, we still want to be able to run this in serial. So or rather, we still want to be able to compile this in serial. So we wrap all our MPI calls with ifdef MPI. So then if you don't have an MPI library installed, you can compile the serial version still. And then after doing after parallelizing each function, check the regression tests. Well, first parallelize the regression tests, then check the regression tests that they're still working. And then a couple of loose ends. So correlation functions, uh, this is what I passed off to Michaela at the end of May. And this, this is a lot of bookkeeping, which Michaela has done a great job of. Um, so you, for correlation function, you pick a random point in the lattice, which then, because that will only be on one process, you have to communicate to all processes so that all processes know which process is going to be doing the um, coordination. Then it gets you, that has to be broadcast to the rest of uh, the data that has to be broadcast so you can actually work out the cost correlations and then communicate it back so that they can be summed and output. So it broke my brain when I was trying to work out how to do that and I had a day left before I was going to Taiwan so I asked Michael to do it and he did. Uh, the other thing is reading input parameters which is far less, far less annoying and far less difficult. It's just a matter of am I on rank zero? Yes, OK, read in all the parameters from the file and MPI broadcast them to the rest of the classes, or to the rest of the, rest of the, rest of the ranks. Nice and simple. So, looking at some performance data, 
So these, again, are plots, well, it's data generated by Mikela, so scripts written by Mikela that I've just tweaked to make them fit on the slide better. So you can see the various lines are the performance for various different combinations of the parallelization in the three dimensions. So you can see this sky blue line here is the, the basically the fastest performance up to eight processes. And that's the case where you have the same parallelization in each of the three dimensions. That then flattens off sharply for different reasons. And so then the next fastest is the gold, which is NT being the, the largest parallelization, which makes sense because that's the, the most non-local one in Fortran. So the, the ordering is NX, NY, NT. So NT, or, uh, yeah, IT is the slowest moving index. So parallelizing one, that makes some sense. And then you can see, and if we pull out slightly wider, you can see things flatten off quite drastically after a, between eight and 12 processes. So this is not what we normally expect from this kind of code. Normally we'd expect it to scale rel almost linearly up to some large number of processes. However, my experience is mostly working with four dimensional code, which obviously has a bigger ratio of computation to communication. So it's gonna, you're gonna have an easier time making it scale well. But yeah, so Mikel has then run some more tests on individual functions in order to try and work out where the performance bottleneck is. So this is looking at two functions, specifically Pongrad and Tiamato, and how their performance depends. So we've got local volume there, and then the, uh, the different points are different parallelizations. So we, here we have 1 times 1 times 1, 2 times 2 times 2, 3 times 3 times 3. So you can see even in the weak scaling case, just moving up here, there's uh, there's a decent slowdown on weak scaling, which is somewhat surprising. And especially in QMR, you can see it's, it's, it's creating quite, quite a big hierarchy of scans there. So if you missed the talk last week, it will be up on YouTube soon, where Michaela was talking about how to actually do the MPI tracing that we were doing to kind of work out what the problem was and all the problems you get when you try and use MPI tracing with MPI FL8. So why doesn't it scale well? Uh, one thing we thought is maybe, okay, persistent send and receive, where we've got a lot of tight loops that we've got send and receive in. Maybe using pers persistent send and receive will help us. <coughs> um, turns out if you're on Broadwell with Omnipath, then you get maybe a 20% speed up from it, which is uh, promising. 20% for MPI communications or for your code? Or oh, total for the code. Total for the code. For the, for these? For the, for the, for, yeah, for this micro benchmark, rather wow. than for the entire executable work. Wow. You don't see anything on Skylake. <laughs> <laughs> so, some, so, it's either moving from Omnipath to Mellanox or moving from Broadwell to Skylake fixes that problem. So it's not the source of us being slow. Yeah, I mean, okay. cool. So uh, we would uh, like to see whether using a persistent or reduce would help us. Unfortunately, it's not yet implemented, so we can't do much about that. Sure, you can make your own, right? <sighs> make your own MPI library, that's fork MPI CLH. No, no, sure, but, but reduce is, is just a handy shortcut, right? The all reduce is a handy shortcut. It's basically a MPI tries to figure out for you what is the best topology for mm. your communication. And if you can work that out for a set number of processes, you can write an old reduce with a persistent sum receive. Maybe we should try. Do, do you know this? And do, does some of this get uploaded to all the other in some cases? Well, Sending I don't know this is how it does. I mean, the, the switches. The switches do they some actually do some. So you wouldn't be able to emulate anything that's happening on the switch? No, I guess not. But you should be able to write an all reduce using send and receive. It's just difficult. Next idea is that we do have non-contiguous send and receive regions. 
So ITAC shows, this, this was discussed last week, that ITAC shows MPI iSend takes a finite amount of time, which given the I stands for it returns immediately, is somewhat surprising. So possibly this is because it has to spend some time rearranging data before it can return. So what would be nice is if you could rearrange the data layout so everything you have to send is in a contiguous buffer and then everything you have to receive is in another contiguous buffer and then it doesn't have to spend that time rearranging it. So uh, Mikel has run some tests and shown that you can get uh, I think it up to 20% again on that. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh... It depends very much on the, on the point you are in the diagram. Yeah, yeah. But between 0 and 20%, or between minus 5 and 20%, I think it was, wasn't it? Speed up from doing that. So, uh, unfortunately, this, this, this was faked by just broadcasting nonsense data rather than actually what you're supposed to be broadcasting. To actually fix it, you'd have to reintroduce indirection after I went to all the trouble of removing it. So, this would be work that we don't have time to do at the moment. So this is on the to-do list for if we get more time. And then finally, the other thing it could be is insufficient hiding of communication. So we've hidden communication as much as possible without having explicit uh, sends or receives inside the the tightest loops inside the Dirac, Dirac operator. So. Um, in principle, we could delay calls to MPI wait or MPI wait all until we reach the relevant section. Um, we've tried this just taking the bits of the direct operator that don't use nearest neighbors um, and moving them before the wait all. And that didn't generate as significant a speed up as we would think from the amount of work, the relative amount of work that's there. So it, it, it hides 10% of the work, but it doesn't give you 10% speed up. So. But it's possible that by moving the bulk of the, the main loop of that function before the MPI wait all, that would give you more speed up, but that would require a restructured loop because at the moment it is just a straight three, three, four, three two loops over X, X, Y, and T, whereas now it would have to be a loop over the inner and then a whole bunch of different <coughs> loops over the outer bits, which is less nice. So, yeah, I, I haven't written the conclusion slide, but yeah, I, I, I have learned five things about MPI and then used them to implement this, and there are some things that we can do to try and scale. I don't think I was, I was completely misguided in moving, removing the indirection. So in, in principle, if I'd left the indirection in, oh, it would be so much easier now because yeah, I could just make things contiguous. But I think that's neglecting the idea that if I, if I hadn't really been in direction, we wouldn't have working code at this point, because I wouldn't have understood it well enough to be able to actually do any kind of refactoring or more API implementation without breaking it. So I think it was a necessary evil to remove the indirection and then possibly reintroduce it later. But possibly more skilled people would uh, argue with me on that. But yeah, that's. All I have to say about what I learned, yeah, it would be significantly less here. So that's basically all I have to say about what I learned about MPI from doing this. So thank you for listening.